Good afternoon. I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to chair in this uh, valuable Congress of Organ Transplantation. This is the fifth Egyptian and the first African uh, uh, Societies of Organ Transplantation meeting. And a special thanks to Professor Gamal Saadi for this uh, meeting. Uh, today I'm going to speak about from humoral theory to performant risk stratification in kidney transplantation. This is the outline of my presentation. I'll start with the introduction, then the anti-HL antibodies journey, non-HL antibodies, some advanced, and I'll end with the risk stratification. From the early beginning of uh, renal transplantation, risk stratification, risk evaluation was there. And the success of the first case of transplantation was because of dependence upon identical twin, identical brother by Professor Joseph Moray on 1954. After that, even cross match was introduced in 1969. And uh, today, the humoral arm and B cell antibodies and the graft outcome are linked together. And uh, the humoral arm, starting from antibodies that combine to receptors on the endothelium that lead to cascade of events that can end with graft inflammation and dysfunction and disruption. So the humoral arm is an outstanding question in transplantation, including basal alloantibodies and the humoral rejection. One of the important items is the development of memory cell, because after the antigen recognition, there is a stimulation of CD4 T cell with subsequent release of cytokine that end with the stimulation of B cell and formation of short-lived plasma cell and the memory B cell and after formation of memory B cell the way is paved for long live plasma cell and the antibody production and the graft this, uh, this disruption. For more than decades we learned the lesson that the presence of donor specific antibody is a real risk a real risk for antibody mediated rejection. This is was a retrospective study. Uh, the uh, CIRA of 154 patients were stored at our lab at the Roger and Flew Center. And then we have uh, we had patients who are were already transplanted for four years, and then evaluating the their CIRA at the time of transplantation by Luminex technology to detect the anti antibodies and to determine its donor specificity and to correlate it with the outcome, we found that the presence of donor specific antibody was associated with significant higher risk of antibody mediated rejection. From that time, we changed our policy to incorporate Luminex technology in evaluating the rest of the patients. So we have plus CDC cross match, we have Luminex to detect anti chile antibodies. So for diagnosis of anti chile antibodies, we have two types of tests. We have either binding tests or functional tests. Binding tests include the flow cytometry cross match and the single engine bead by Luminex, because by these two methods, we can diagnose the presence of antibodies. And the functional assay, including CDC cross match and the C1Q assay. And the, what is the difference between binding? and the functional assay for the binding assay here, the, uh, if you look here, we need a uh, high level to have positive uh, cross here, here in the functional assay, we, we, uh, we uh, want a high level to have positive uh, reaction. So the low level of antibody is not detected by the function assay by CDC cross match or C1Q assay. The low level of antibodies can be detected easily by flu cytometric cross match or single engine beta assay, and this is the difference between binding and function assay. The presence of preformed donor specific antibodies, anti chill antibodies, is bad news because, as you see here, this is a graph survival, is reduced significantly by the presence of donor specific antibody in comparison to those who have no donor specific antibody. 
and this is the two categories of patients with low with uh, uh, mean fluorescent intensity below 3,000 units, and this is about 3,000. Uh, and uh, the impact of the presence of preformed anti-HL antibody is more manifest in live donor kidney transplantation because here, even if the MFI is less than 3,000, the hazard risk or graft is uh, graft survival is uh, reduced uh, 2.1 fold, and the graft failure occurs 2.1 fold higher, and it increases to 2.9, almost three fold, if MFI is about 3,000. This is in live donor kidney transplantation. In comparison to cadaveric one, it, it, it still there is a, a rule, uh, as you see in the hazard risk is significant here, if it's about 3,000. So the conclusion of this study, performed, preformed donor specific antibodies were associated with a higher risk for graft loss, which was greater in living than disease donation. Even this is below 3,000 MFI, were associated with uh, worse graft survival. So this is the lesson. What about the evolution of donor-specific antibodies? Because donor-specific antibodies, by the time, may disappear or persist. So this study categorized patients into either negative or positive DSA, and those who have positive DSA to have resolved DSA or persistent DSA. Persistence of DSA is associated with a drastic outcome because death tensor the graft survival is reduced significantly by the persistent DSA. And the effect is more impressive and more effective and the reduction of graft survival is more manifest if the presence of persistent DSA is associated with development of antibody mediated rejection. So, what about complement binding? Because Luminex detects the anti chill antibody, but the regular Luminex technology doesn't tell us about the complement binding capabilities of anti chill antibodies. This is why there is innovation in the, in the Luminex by testing for complement, either C1Q binding cats or T3D binding cats. One of the most recent articles is the prognostic value of C3D fixing preformed donor specific antibodies in cross match positive living kidney transplantation highly sensitized patients for whom desensitization protocol was applied. If C3D binding is positive, the antibody rejection is higher significant and we need larger studies to document if, the, if there is response or non-response in 3D binding uh, and uh, their effect on transplant outcome. Again, this 3D fixing DSA, it seems that it is uh, effective to predict the prognosis. prognosis. Regarding de novo DSA, what's meant by de novo DSA, it is newly formed anti chill antibodies, which is donor specific after transplantation. And uh, this study shows the presence or the development of de novo DSA is real bad news associated with lower graft survival, especially if it is uh, IgG subclass IgG3. So IgG3, de novo DSA is associated with reduction of, G, of the uh, graft survival, especially if it's complicated by uh, rejection. Regarding HLA ADQ antibody DSA, this is a, a new paradigm in thinking not only to uh, test for the R, but for the Q. So this is why if we have recipient with DQ antibodies, anti-HLA antibodies against DQ, we should know the HLA DQ of the donor to document specificity or to diagnose, or to diagnose donor specific or not. Even for this immediate rejection, the presence of DSA is not good. And here in this study, the presence of DSA plus TC immediate rejection carry the, the worst prognosis and the hazard risk increased by 3.6 fold in the univariate and 2.3 fold in the multivariate analysis. So even in TC immediate rejection, the presence of DSA uh, impact is uh, evident. 
So the, the and if we compare it to patients who have uh, negative DSA plus the cell rejection or both of DSA and negative cell rejection, you will find the combination. It is a deadly alliance. Presence of DSA plus the cell rejection, both of them carry bad news. And if we add to this cocktail, DSA plus the cell rejection plus non-adherence, the outcome is uh, very uh, manifest. So graft survival is reduced significantly uh, if the if there is DSA plus the cell rejection plus non-adherence. Why there is a link between the humoral and the T cell mediated? Because the humoral means T cell, and the humoral and the T cell means and the cellular means the T cell. If we have sufficient immune suppression, everything will uh, is adjusted. But in the in the absence of sufficient immune suppression or with insufficient immune suppression, like non-adherence, you'll find here activation of T helper cell. So B cell stimulates T helper cell, and T helper cell releases uh, soluble uh, CD30 in the serum, and this will lead to B cell maturation, persistent and de novo C1Q DSA antibody mediated rejection and graft loss. So this means that there is intricate and interconnection between T cell and the B cell arms of uh, adaptive immunity. Another axis, which is in the cellular mesenchymal transition, as you see here by this study, that addresses markers of graftomicrovascular epithelial injury, may identify another factor who uh, harmful donor specific antigen antibodies and the predict allograft loss. As uh, shown here, the studying the endo, endocellial mesenchymal trans, transition is associated with poorer survival. All of us know that Luminex is very sensitive and very specific to anti HL antibodies. To the extent that some authors stated that it is 100%. No test in the medicine is 100% efficacy. Uh, because of this, there is caveats of HLA antibody detection by solid phase assays. So we have false negative and false positive. False negative like dilution of the MFI signal across multiple beads sharing the same epitope. If the antibody is against a certain epitope, so which is shared uh, by many antigen the beads, so it is distributed to all these uh, engine the beads leading to false and negative results. Another important point is if we have antibodies that have the capability to bind complement, so fragments of complement after complement activation but, uh, prevent these antibodies to bind to the epitopes on the beads and this will, will give false and negative. And this is known as prozone effects because of complement activation that prevent the uh, detection of uh, MFI. To solve this problem, we have a standardization of the lab to do some techniques like EDITA ATC. Uh, we may have false positive results like exposure of new epitopes, unspecific binding of serum matrix component, HL antibodies present in medical products like voloclonum and the famous globulin. Another interesting point, if we have DSA and we have no rejection, this study is uh, the results of this report, donor specific antibodies in the absence of rejection are not a risk factor for allograft failure. But I think from our practice, it is very wise. If we have DSA, just to take care of the patient, we may think of uh, uh, cerebellum biopsy, or at least we shouldn't allow drastic reduction of immune suppression without uh, the evidence of reduction of DSAs. Because the uh, presence of DSA and we reduce immune suppression, this may create the pathway for chronic antibody rejection. What about non-HLA? There is a great difference between HLA antigens and non-HLA antigens. Both HLA antigens are spread on the surface, so the presence of anti-HLA antibodies, uh, uh, the presence of these antibodies carries uh, a definite prognosis, bad prognosis. 
What about non-HLA antibodies? Non-HLA antigens by default are hidden antigens. And the patients may have non-HLA antibodies before transplantation. So let us review this issue because a lot of data are there currently. In the past, there was no uh, simple laboratory tests to detect non-HLA antibodies. Sometimes uh, they, uh, the, uh, in the lab, they can do endothelial cross match for detection of endothelial antibodies. However, nowadays there are a lot of innovations and the simplicity of the lab to detect many non-HLA antibodies. So if you go to the, this uh, journal, the issue of August this year, there are 11 manuscripts about non-HLA antibodies and the review article. So when we attended uh, the ESOT, European Society of Organ Transplantation meeting, there was uh, a discussion about non-HLA antibodies presented uh, uh, and elegantly by uh, Professor uh, Angeli Xu. And uh, in his presentation, he presented a lot of data about the non-HLA antibodies, but again and again, there was no consensus about the practicality of doing routine testing for non-HLA antibodies. Let us to review some of them. Angiotensin, two type one receptor antibodies. Although it is antibodies against angiotensin two type one receptor, but this antibody carries agonistic effect. So it will lead to uh, profound angiotensin two uh, activation, inflammation, vasoconstriction, and the vasculitis. This is why the, uh, uh, the, uh, if you look at the data, you'll find here significant difference in the graft survival if there is positive angiotensin uh, two type one receptor antibodies in comparison to a negative one. And if the antibodies against angiotensin two type one receptor is combined with anti HLA antibodies, I think, as you see here, the impact is very significant. And one of the important points is the effect of these antibodies, and you can see two type one receptor antibodies is dependent on concentration. And even in, in uh, children, in transplantation, solid transplantation, the effects of angiotensin uh, two type one receptor antibodies uh, can lead to uh, humoral uh, reactions. And the treatment armamentarium includes uh, IVIG plasma apheresis plus angiotensin receptor blocker or uh, the blocking uh, two series. And we are waiting an evidence for that. A very interesting study that uh, was published in, uh, in August, proactive treatment of angiotensin receptor antibodies in kidney transplantation with plasma exchange and or cancer 10, uh, as you see here, it is safe and associated with excellent graft survival at four years. This is a single center Australian experience and this maneuver and intervention was done for patients with antibodies uh, above 17 units per ml, ml, uh, ml. and this is, this, is, this is 44 patients. Don't forget that this angiotensin 2 type 1 receptor antibodies have many phases, good, bad, and ugly. Good, why? Because they lead to transient vasoconstriction, so it uh, transient vasoconstriction maintains vascular tone, uh, help in regulation of blood flow, sodium retention and sodium secretion. Uh, tissue repair, uh, extra soil matrix deposition, wound healing and cell mi migration, wound healing and immune response. The bad phase of this antibodies is hypertension, cardiovascular disease, cellular infiltration and excessive matrix deposition. The ugly phase, uh, is reflected by malignant hypertension, preeclampsia, tissue hypoxic, fibrosis, rejection, allogast loss, uh, and other diseases. Another issue uh, of non HLA antibodies is anti bimental antibodies. It's debatable, but after endothelial injury damage, uh, anti bimental uh, antibodies lead to cause splitted aggregation and the vascular endothelial damage, exacerbating apparent uh, expression in transplantation may be reflected by fibrosis and tuberosity, although it is not uh, very specific. This is a case report 
where the anti vimentin antibodies explain the humoral rejection and as you see, interstitial hemorrhage, vasculitis, and endothelial activation. And, and, and this is the implantation biopsy, weak expression of antibodies, but uh, day two, there was a manifest uh, deposition uh, in this case. Regarding advances, uh, for many years, we consider natural antibodies as innocent with, without harm. However, in this study, in this uh, article, the, it seems that the uh, presence of natural antibodies may be associated with them, danger associated molecular patterns, oxidation specific epiphobes, and this may lead to uh, reaction. However, it is very uncertain and we need further studies for this point. Uh, endothelial antibodies, and as I mentioned, it may be detected by the endothelial first match, and a lot of endothelial, uh, endothelial injury may be witnessing if the, the uh, problematic issue. Uh, this study included a large number of patients. This is a nationwide cohort, including 4,770 recipients, and they test uh, antibodies against ARHGDIB, RHOGDB dissociation inhibitor 2 with long term kidney allograft loss. And as you see, the antibody is highly expressed with endothelial with damage. And as, as uh, shown from this study, the presence of antibodies uh, against ARHGDIB, if this uh, here is positive uh, in red color either adjusted or unadjusted, you will find the graft survival is drastically affected in deceased donor transplantation, and this is 3,200 cases. In living donor transplantation, 1,400 cases, there was no significant difference. So again, we need further studies. A very interesting uh, issue uh, of the American Journal of Transplantation, you can see the cover, delay between proximal complete tubule and, uh, and immunity. So back signaling of HLA class one molecule and the T and natural killer cell receptor ligands in epithelial cells reflects the rejection a specific microenvironment in the biopsies and this is the editorial comment. So the, uh, uh, we have do uh, uh, HLA class one CD155 and CD166 trigger proximal tubule in the epithelial cell uh, to contribute to rejection. So this is the class one. And if there is interaction to the presence of this cell, natural killer cell or DSA, any of these, either innate or acquired adaptive immunity, is stimulate proximal convertible cell to release cytokines and cytokines will induce induction of cytokine and the chemokine secretion that contribute to antibody based rejection and the cell based rejection. So for the first time, the microenvironment is essential, and I think this will open the horizon for more and more research. Again, adaptive features of innate immunity and their relevance to graft rejection is nicely uh, reviewed in this uh, in the current opinion of the transplantation. Innate immune cells can acquire features of memory such that they respond more vigorously to secondary challenges. Natural killer cells, monocytes, and macrophages are known to respond and reject allografts via different mechanisms. And why we are interested in immunology? Because this is the, uh, the transplant outcome. The most common cause of that loss is chronic antibody based rejection. So we want to understand immunology. Uh, this is why we would like to have a well established accredited lab and to do research. And also, with the refinement of immunology workup, we can stratify the risk of the patients. So this is the, I think this is a common practice. If we look at HLA donor specific antibody, it is present, yes, with memory immune response against HLA, this is considered high risk. The key question for better risk stratification, what about the magnitude, durability of memory immune response, a B top target of DSA, yeah, and as uh, evidenced from the high resolution fish diving. If there is no HLA DCA, we ask ourselves about the HLA mismatch. If there is HLA mismatch, 
we got A, B, C, D, D, R, D1, and DQ. If yes, de novo immune response against HLA, and this is considered a standardized risk. So immunogenicity of mismatched HLA before the end of the question should be understood more and more. If there is no DSA, no mismatches, this is a low risk uh, transplantation. Even in highly sensitized patients with high immunological risk, we would like to know the mode of sensitization, duration of response, the class of antibodies, and the grouping of the antibody IgG1 free ATC. And I think, although it is not present everywhere in many centers, the dependence upon high resolution images of HLA matches to detect the ablet mismatch load may change the face of transplantation to accept a certain ablet mismatch load and to avoid the high, high load uh, or even to predict those who will develop rejection by studying the patient mis um, uh, tissue typing by high resolution. I think this will be the future and we are waiting further evidence because if you look, look here for a before mismatch, if it's between 0 to 5, this is the reference. Between 6 to 12, the, this is the other risk that increases to this risk if the uh, if it is uh, the if it is above 13 the ablet mismatch and this is the confidence interval you can find here very significant if it is above 13. So we have cutoff point if it's above 13 ablet mismatch this is a bad and associated with definite outcome. And again this is for a coronic mediated rejection. Again, antibody mediated rejection is a puzzle, and we should know everything about the DSA and IgG isotypes, C1Q, C4D, 3D binding, timing, MFI. Is it a real a quantitative or it is semi quantitative? By the way, it is not FDA approved as a quantitative of anti chill antibodies, so it seems that. We need to understand uh, many issues about that. And for my mind, as a practical way, we should improve the, our capabilities for doing the test, standardize the test. Because even changing the protocol, changing the uh, technician, or even using uh, different uh, techniques or applying different protocols with the same kit, this can create big headache and differences in results. So this is the North American ASHI Appearance Laboratories. Using editor DTT, you can find the percentage, and the, by this way, they can reduce protozoan effect, the effects of complement activation. This is a panoramic view of humoral reaction. We have uh, T cell, T follicular cells, B cell, memory cell, plasma cell, antibody, complement, all these are the components uh, of the humoral rejection. And if you look here, you'll find for each point, there is uh, armamentarium of management. So we have uh, different drugs, IVIG, CD20, monoplant, what is either it's map or uh, obinutuzumab and eclizumab, C1 stress inhibitor. And uh, in the future, we are waiting the results of CD38 because it's specific for plasma cell, protozoan inhibitors and new generations. And by the way, and there are evolving as shown in the ESOP uh, generation, four generation of complement uh, uh, drugs. And for my mind, they are waiting the results of anti interleukin 6, Tuselizumab, and Classic uh, Zumab. I think the, this pathway and anti CD40, so anti CD40 and anti interleukin 6, I think they are promising in the future. Let me to end with the prediction. This is a very nice study. The, uh, this is the, the study included one, 139 cases for whom the diagnosis of antibody made rejection was established. At the time of diagnosis, the patients have the, uh, their sera uh, investigated for the presence of DSA and the C1Q binding capability. And in the same moment, the biopsy details are there. After applying standard of treatment, IVIG, plasma, and rituximab, the patients were evaluated three months later by repeating biopsy and serology for DSA and C1Q binding. And they create 
created the prediction and uh, uh, evaluated uh, uh, the difference between patients who have persistent negative C1Q, C1Q which became negative, and C1Q which is either persistent to the positive or changes to positive. The outcome is very bad if the C1Q is uh, positive, either persistent to the positive or change it from negative for positive. The graph survival is significantly affected. And this, this is a very smart uh, predictor algorithm because it, it combines the level of kidney function that what, uh, as what we do in our uh, real practice. So uh, uh, what about the level of the GFR after treatment of antichelin antibody? And then look at C1Q binding and the presence of transatlantic neuropathy in the, in the biopsy. If there is C1Q binding, if it is positive, as you see here, the graph survival five years of survival is very low, as you see, 35%. If there is a low GFR after treatment, transplant glomerulopathy in the biopsy, and C1Q binding uh, is there. If C1Q binding, uh, if, if there is no transplant glomerulopathy, this is the outcome. If transplant glomerulopathy is there, the outcome is 33% five-year survival. So the components of this algorithm is the low GFR after the treatment, the presence of transplanted glomerulopathy, and the persistence of C1Q binding. You will find here, and you can read five-year survival for each point of the algorithm. Even for TCL mediated rejection, here the level of kidney function after treatment of TCL mediated rejection, and here they add the DSA. So the post-treatment post -treatment development of HLA-DSA, which is yes, the prognostic group here, the uh, fifth, 10 year is just 57%. So it seems that there is link between TCL mediated rejection and the antibody mediated rejection. What we would like to uh, have is to refine our lab to, uh, to have research in this uh, area, and I think if we refine our understanding and our lab and do better research, excellent high quality research, I think it can be translated into better outcomes. Meanwhile, we should keep learning and education. And I'm happy because we reach this number of lectures and videos uh, through the, our virtual academy. And the, I would like to end by my quotation. We should continue as a student forever because a doctor is a student until he dies. Once he considers himself not a student anymore, the doctor of him dies. Thank you for, for your good uh, attention, and I'll be happy if you have any question. Uh, thank you.